The House will be in order. The prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Reverend Joseph Shea from St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church, Simi Valley, California. Lord God, as we gather today, I ask your blessings upon these men and women whom you and this great nation have chosen to serve us. Grant them the grace to be leaders whose walk is by faith, whose behavior is by principle, whose vision is high, whose pride is low, and whose love for you and this wonderful nation is wide and deep. Grant that these leaders be ribbed with the steel of your spirit so that their strength will be equal to the task, that they won't fade under the light of scrutiny, that they will be calm amidst the storms of criticism, that they won't bend amidst the storms of criticism and bend under the heavy load of responsibility, and that they will courageously hold high the torch of your truth to guide them. We ask these blessings in your holy name. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Hochul. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, the chair will entertain up to, without objection, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagher, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've known uh, Father Joseph Shea since he was appointed pastor of St. Rosalima Parish in my home city of Simi Valley, California. And he's been there now for approximately four years, and we've worked together on several projects that have benefited our community. It is befitting that we continue the tradition of having pastors from across our country open the people's house with a prayer for our nation and its people. I want to thank the Reverend Patrick J. Conroy, Chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives, for giving Father Shea the opportunity to open today's session of the House. Having guest chaplains from across the country participate in this historical undertaking truly does manifest the freedom of worship enjoyed across the United States. I also want to thank Father Shea for traveling all the way across this great nation to be here with us this morning to offer the spiritual opening for the day. And Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair will entertain 15 further requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor Donald Kaczynski from my home state of Arkansas. Donald is a Marine veteran with a passion for serving other veterans who are living with a disability. After receiving an honorable discharge from the Marines, Donald was faced with the challenge of finding a new career. He saw firsthand the obstacles disabled veterans face and knew he wanted to help other veterans have a higher quality of life. After moving to Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, he started a mobile concession stand business. With his business, Donald drives to events throughout Arkansas providing concessions for veterans' gatherings. In addition to his business, Donald serves Arkansas's veterans as commander and adjutant of the Hot Springs Village VFW. Most recently, Donald was elected to serve as the 2011-2012 state commander of the Disabled American Veterans Department of Arkansas. In 2004, Donald was recognized as the VFW Man of the Year for Arkansas and in 2008 as the Disabled American Veterans Man of the Year. Madam Speaker, we honor Donald Kaczynski and his service to Arkansas's veterans. Yield back. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As we recall the brave heroes of the D-Day invasion 68 years ago today, I thought of the new American heroes who are fighting for us on the front lines in Afghanistan a place I left a few weeks ago and the 36 hours I spent in the war zone speaking to them. Conversations with generals, diplomats, and the troops on the ground confirmed that Pakistan, 
Pakistan remains a safe haven for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. First, it was proof to the world when Osama bin Laden was found to be hiding there for a length, lengthy amount of time. But now on Monday, a drone strike just over the Pakistani border that killed Al-Qaeda's number two come in command, further proving beyond all doubt that Pakistan continues to harbor terrorists. If Pakistan is unwilling to condemn these international terrorists and work with the United States to find them, they should not be eligible for foreign aid, period, end. I, worked, I pledge to continue to work in a bipartisan way with my colleagues to restrict funds as long as Pakistan sits by and provides refuge to terrorists who put our troops that I just left and our nation in harm's way. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Expired. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from West Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, the state of West Virginia lost one of its greatest residents, greatest citizens last week, and I lost a very close friend. Former head coach of the West Virginia University's football team and New Martinsville native Bill Stewart unexpectedly passed away on May 28th. Stewart was a man of integrity and high moral character who practiced truly what he preached, both on and off the field. As the head coach of the Mountaineers, he represented our state and the university in the best possible way. His signature win over Oklahoma in the 2008 Fiesta Bowl launched him into the national spotlight. His legacy will be that of a type of life that he led. Coach Stu never met a stranger, and he never lost sight of his home. He lived each day to its fullest and had a contagious enthusiasm that inspired everyone around him. Leave no doubt. Leave no doubt, Bill Stewart will be missed for years to come because he was a man of his word, a man who openly followed his faith and a dedicated father, husband, and friend. Bill Stewart took that final, dusty, windy country home road home to his place in heaven. Madam Speaker, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise today to speak out about the need to pass the transportation bill. I am very frustrated by the inaction of the House Republican conferees and how the obstructionism is negatively affecting job creation in this country. The current transportation extension expires at the end of this month, and we are in the height of summer construction season and we're losing the opportunity to get these jobs going in construction and your manufacturing industries back to work. Our surefire way to create a job is investing in our country's infrastructure, but House Republicans obstructing at every turn. Last month, we were forced to pass a 10th temporary extension of highway funding because of the GOP inaction. This is my 20th year here, and this is the first time that this bill has been held up because of partisanism. This inaction only increases instability for the construction industry and makes it impossible for state and local governments to plan long term. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. The lady's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, according to the Social Security trustees, the Social Security Disability Program is expected to exhaust its trust fund in just four years. If the fund is exhausted, only about around 80 percent of the benefits would be paid out if nothing is done. Over 11 million Americans could be impacted. Again, we have another government entitlement program headed towards bankruptcy. This is a program that costs as much as the annual budgets of the Departments of Agriculture, Homeland Security, Commerce, Labor, Interior, and Justice combined. I know how important this program is to many of my own constituents. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the Disability Program, tens of millions of people rely on these programs, but they are not structurally sound 
Doing nothing is not the answer. And taking funds from general revenue does nothing to provide the long-term stability that we need. We need real, innovative reform that fixes our problems, that saves and strengthens these programs without piling up debt. If we don't act to save and strengthen these programs, our creditors will make the decisions for us down the road. We need to address these problems in a bipartisan manner. One party can't do it alone. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the uh, gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor Anthony Anderson, a rising junior at LaSalle Academy in my home state of Rhode Island. Earlier this year, Anthony was awarded a gold medal from the National Scholastic Art and Writing Awards for a self-portrait he submitted focused on the issue of bullying. Anthony has been recognized each year by the National Scholastic Art and Writing Awards since he was in seventh grade. And this month, Anthony's painting is on display at an art gallery in New York City. His family and his art teacher at LaSalle were invited to Carnegie Hall last week for a ceremony honoring his work and the work of other gold medal winners from across our nation. I congratulate Anthony on his impressive accomplishments and join Rhode Islanders all across our state in wishing him continued success in the years ahead. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Illinois seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, too often people in Washington forget that it's our small businesses that create jobs, not government. These men and women are doing the most important work to bring about economic recovery and growth. In fact, over the past 17 years, small businesses have created an impressive 65 percent of all new American jobs. So today, Madam Speaker, I urge my colleagues to join me in celebrating the successes of our local job creators, including two individuals from my district who are being recognized by the U.S. Small Business Administration SCORE and the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Congratulations to Kathy Kwan, CEO of Park Corporation, a plastic recycling company in Romeoville, Illinois, on being named Exporter of the Year. And a hearty salute to Mike Rohan, president of All Trust Home Care Incorporated in Hinsdale, Illinois, who has earned the Entrepreneurial Success of the Year Award. These achievements are an important reminder to Congress that we must put politics aside and work to, together to create an environment where leaders like Mike and Kathy can do their, what they do best, create jobs. I yield back. The gentlelady's time, uh, gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. American innovators contribute to an economy second to none and provide strategic advantage in national security. But where will the advancement of tomorrow come? The U.S. ranks 27th in world in the world and graduates with science and engineering degrees and the last thing Congress should do is to make education less affordable. Yet that's exactly what will happen on June 30th if Congress fails to act. Interest rates on student loans will double, hiking the yearly payments a thousand dollars for more than seven million students in this country. April's Republican roots of tying student loan interest rates to, uh, to the evisceration a preventive health care for women and children was an unconscionable partisan ploy. No parent should be forced to choose between their child's health and education. No woman should have to choose between breast cancer screening and a student loan. Lowered interest rates were the result of bipartisan cooperation with a Democratic Congress and a Republican president. We must stop the interest rate hike in a responsible and bipartisan manner, and I urge for speedy action and yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask you to consent to be recognized as the House Speaker. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish you could meet my friend, Dr. Galen Biker, a truly Renaissance man who was born in Iowa but raised in Hudsonville, Michigan, in my district, where he grew up in a family that was very entrepreneurial and very politically involved. His father actually served as a state senator, Gary Biker. Galen attended Calvin College, where he is now president, uh, and earned a BA in, with concentrations in philosophy, English, political science, and, a, and speech with a minor in Russian. He also entered the Army in 1967 and served in Vietnam and dis was discharged with the rank of captain. 
He went on to earn a law degree at the University of Michigan and then his master's degree in world politics at Michigan as well. After that, he decided he needed to get his PhD in international relations from Pennsylvania. He then served and worked in an energy exploration company out of Houston. He worked on Wall Street, uh, both, uh, both uh, on energy as well as derivatives and futures. He then served as a lawyer in Philadelphia. He's been involved in many numerous organizations and volunteer opportunities, including the Rough Grouse Society uh, of the United States. He's an avid hunter and a pretty good shot as well, I might add. Uh, he became president of Calvin College in 1995, where he has served it since then, in the last 17 years. Galen is truly a person who has left a place better than when he found it. And, and Dr. Biker, we just want to say thank you for your service to Calvin College and the greater, uh, in the greater community in West Michigan. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota seek recognition? Just ask for one minute. The uh, gentleman is recognized without objection. Madam Speaker, I rise today to bring attention to what is a very serious problem for the families of at least 1,300 workers, 900 of whom live in my state of Minnesota. They've been in a labor dispute with their company, and on Friday, there's a chance to go back to the bargaining table to come up with a good settlement. Now, these workers, they didn't go on strike. They've been locked out. Been locked out for 10 months uh, at American Crystal Sugar Factory in Moorhead, Minnesota. Many of these people have worked at this factory their entire lives, Madam Speaker, and are really good, solid members of their community. These workers have gone to work, and they've actually stood up and gone to bat for the company, particularly regarding the sugar program, and many other ways, countless ways as well. These workers even vowed not to go on strike because they know how important their work is to the company and the community. The only thing they've done wrong is they haven't been able to pay their higher health insurance costs, which is the real crux of the negotiation. This Friday, the sides are going back to the bargaining table for the first time in four months. I commend both labor and management for getting back to the table. But Madam Speaker, I urge management to listen carefully to the pleas of these workers and to come up with a fair settlement. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. In 2009, the Obama administration said that unemployment would never reach 8% if the stimulus was approved. Well, it was. And three years later, $1.2 trillion in spending unemployment has remained above 8% for 40 consecutive months, the longest span since the Great Depression. Even more alarming is that the 8% doesn't illustrate how grim the situation really is. More than 500,000 more Americans are out of work today than they were when President Obama took office in 2009. And the percentage of Americans working is at a 30-year low. Unemployment would be even higher if it were not for the, the grit and the resolve of the American people themselves. And with these numbers, it's clear that President Obama's agenda, well, it's failed and it's making the economy worse. House Republicans have a plan. They have a plan for America's job creators to help turn this economy around. And it's time for the President, it's time for the Senate Democrats to stop blocking jobs for Americans and to join us in helping get Americans back to work. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Advising Senator Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to mark the 68th anniversary of the Allied Expeditionary Forces landing in Normandy, France at the start of the end of World War II. The Allied invasion of Europe was led by a native Kansan born in Abilene and truly great American hero, former President General Dwight Ike Eisenhower. On the morning of June 6, 1944, General Eisenhower inspired his men to fight for the values of liberty and freedom, stating, quote, your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelmingly superior superiority in weapons and munitions or war and placed at our great disposal great reserves of trained men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. Good luck.
and let us beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. We all remember the tremendous sacrifices the greatest generation gave for the cause of freedom and liberty as we mark this solemn and honored anniversary today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to address the House of Women. Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm here to ask that the Republican budget respect our seniors. You know, you've got to ask ourselves, why are we giving those who make over a million dollars about $394,000 on an average in tax cuts? And those making between twenty dollars and $30,000 get $129. Why? And why is it that there's about $3 trillion in breaks that we are giving to big business, big oil, gas, and the super rich? Why are we doing that? And then, and then there's an effort in the Republican budget to change Medicare to the voucher program. This is why the AARP says Republicans are shifting the cost to our seniors and ending the Medicare guarantee, that guarantee that many of them rely upon. And our Congressional Budget Office agrees with this. The attacks on the Affordable Care Act by the Republicans also, also are going to set us back. That act closes the donut hole for the seniors. Prescription drugs also allows them to have preventative health care. And we're taking that away too. Madam Speaker, let's just respect our seniors, respect them, and not do what we're doing. Thank you. Time's expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and exclude extraneous material on the further consideration of 5325 and that, may I, that I may include tabular material on the same. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 667 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 5325. Will the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Roth Layton, kindly take the chair? The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 5325, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for energy and water development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole rose on Tuesday, June 5th, 2012, the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, had been disposed of and the bill had been read through page 56, line 24. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Madam Chair, I rise to strike the last word for the purpose of engaging in a colloquy the with the gentleman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Into a colloquy with the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Hurd, and I would like to yield to the gentleman from Virginia for that purpose. The gentleman Thank is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, in Virginia's 5th District, state and local officials have been working diligently to attract new businesses to create new jobs in Southside Virginia. In Henry County, uh, a county located in Virginia's 5th District, local officials have identified a 200-acre site that has the potential to attract major economic development opportunities at a time when Martinsville and Henry County suffers from the highest unemployment rate in Virginia, uh, at 15 percent and 10 percent respectively. Unfortunately, federal regulators, including the Army Corps of Engineers, have resisted moving forward with this important initiative and stalled the county's permit application because of the lack of an identified end user for the site. At the same time, the potential companies who would invest in this site and create jobs in Southside Virginia are unwilling to commit their resources due to the risk and time delays associated with an outstanding permit with the Corps. While state regulators have issued permits for the Henry County site, the Corps continues to be steadfast in its unwillingness to move forward with the permit, even though they have issued permits for similar speculative development projects in the past, which subsequently attracted new industries and jobs to that area. Mr. Chairman, this site represents an economic opportunity that could bring thousands of jobs to an area of Virginia, of Virginia that is still struggling with double-digit unemployment. 
This project has bipartisan support from members of the congressional delegation as well as from our governor, Bob McDonald. Virginia has proven that it is the most attractive state for business and is recognized as such in the past year. If given the opportunity, I have no doubt that the site would be the impetus for economic development in Martinsville and Henry County, an area which needs economic development more than ever. Mr. Chairman, I would ask your assistance in working with me to ensure that federal re regulators are not needlessly stalling economic development and job creation in Virginia's 5th District and other areas of our country. I thank the gentleman and I yield back uh, to, I yield to the gentleman from New Jersey. I thank the gentleman from Virginia for bringing these concerns to my attention. I agree that we must assure that federal agencies and regulations are not contributing to, to unnecessary delays that harm economic development and job creation, especially at a time of economic distress and high, high employment. I pledge, our committee pledges, to work with the gentleman and others who have seen an overreaching regulatory process negatively affect job prospects in their districts to address these problems. Reclaiming my time, I thank the chairman for his leadership uh, in the, on this bill and on this issue, and I look forward to working with him. I yield back my time. Does the gentleman yield back? I yield time? back my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose is the... Uh, Chair Booth, this right to last word. The gentleman is recognized. I uh, would like at this point to, to recognize the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to engage in a colloquy with the chairman and the ranking member. Mr. Speaker, I'm here today to express my concern with the future of the nation's inland waterway system. The bill before us today, despite the chairman's best efforts, continues a trend of underfunding needed infrastructure improvements in our nation's locks and dams. This underfunding is a combination of the administration's request and lack of a long-term solution to the Inland Waterways Trust Fund. Locks and dams are a crucial mechanism of commerce and mode of transportation in Pennsylvania. They allow for the transport of commodities that are essential to businesses in my region, like coal, grain, and scrap metal. Along the Allegheny River, the Army Corps' budget for operating and maintaining locks and dams was cut by nearly one half in just one year. Projects on other rivers in the Pittsburgh region, the Ohio and Monongahela, have slowed to a stop or are in need of repair. The cuts to this fund has the Corps and surrounding communities and businesses wondering exactly how or if a repair will be made if something breaks. But this is only a portion of the work that needs to be done. And the mechanism that we have to fund new or major rehabilitation projects, the Inland Waterway Trust Fund, is also in need of repair. Even in times of fiscal restraint, we must find ways to fund projects that protect our safety and allow the use of our waterways for commerce. The longer we wait to fully respond to the critical needs for our infrastructure, the more they're going to cost. Mr. Chairman, just in a recent article in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the quote from our local Corps of, of, uh, course person said, this is it for the Allegheny locks and dams. If something breaks, we've got to scramble for funds and there's no guarantee we'll fix it. This has forced the Corps to adopt a fix-when-fail attitude towards maintaining about 200 locks and related dams on 11,000 miles of the nation's rivers. The average lock is over 60 years old. In Pittsburgh, they're over 80 years old. Mr. Chairman, I would like to work with you and the ranking member to find a solution to this urgent need, and I'd like to yield time to Mr. Critz to express his concerns on this issue. And I would yield the to Mr. Critz at this time. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Doyle, Mr. Voskoski, and Chairman, for yielding time. I'd like to add my voice to Mr. Doyle. Doyle's on the issue of aging, the aging state of our nation's waterways, and the vast shortfalls in funding urgently needed projects. I believe the Chairman has done his best, given the limited funds available in the Trust Fund, and would like to work with the gentleman from New Jersey to find a long-term solution to this issue. Consisting of over 230 lock chambers, our inland waterways move hundreds of millions of tons of cargo annually. To move this cargo on the nation's highways would require an additional 24 million trucks, would cost billions more in fuel costs, and generate millions of tons of pollution. The federal government has invested in this infrastructure for over 200 years. 
The locks and dams that are the backbone of this system are built with a 50-year design life, yet many, for example, those on the Monongahela River in western Pennsylvania, are over 100 years old. I am deeply troubled by the lack of funding for these projects and specifically on the lack of progress on finding a solution to the funding shortfalls in the Inla Inland Waterways Trust Fund. This fund generates roughly $85 million per year through a fuel tax on barges, yet falls well short of the $380 million per year the Inla Inland Waterways Users Board estimates is needed to fully fund capital reinvestments in the system. The Department of Transportation projects that the waterway traffic will increase 20 percent by 2020. We can no longer afford to sit on, on our hands and wait for these vital lanes of commerce to fill. We need to invest in America and keep our federal waterways open for business. The inland waterway system is far too important to allow it to continue to languish with inadequate funding and crumbling infrastructure. I look forward to working with the chairman, the ranking member, and Mr. Doyle to find a solution to this urgent need, and I yield back. The would gentleman from the chairman of the subcommittee. The gentleman from Pennsylvania that I share their concern with the funding of the inland system and the solvency of the Inland Waterways Trust Fund. This is why you see extensive report language on the Olmsted Lock and Dam and the cost overruns at that project as well as language on the trust it's fund itself. As the gentlemen are aware, any changes to address the solvency of the trust fund are most appropriately discussed within the authorizing committees. I know they are aware of the situation and are evalu evaluating various options. The gentleman from Indiana's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? I move to strike the last word and to yield to the ranking uh, member. The gentleman for the is recognized. And the gentleman from Indiana is. I appreciate the gentleman yielding very much and simply would associate myself with the chairman's remark, Mr. Chris's remark, and Mr. Doyle's remark, and would simply conclude uh, my portion uh, by thanking uh, both gentlemen uh, for raising this vital issue. Uh, we engage in investing in infrastructure uh, in Afghanistan. We create infrastructure investment in Iraq and elsewhere, it is time that we repair and invest in the infrastructure, the waterway infrastructure in the United States of America to create jobs in the short term and to create jobs in the future. And again, I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank the gentleman uh, for raising this issue and look forward to working with him. I appreciate the chairman yielding to me. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Yield back. He yields back. Who Thanks seeks you. recognition? The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. For what purpose? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. This designated as number one. Pursuant. Am amendment offered by Mr. Flake of Arizona. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. Each amount made available by this act, other than an amount required to be made available by a, pre a provision of law, is hereby reduced by point two seven two six zero six nine zero zero eight four eight nine seven five seven six percent pursuant to the order of the house of today the gentleman from arizona mr flake and a member opposed will each control five minutes thank you madam speaker uh... funded at thirty two billion dollars the f y uh, twenty thirteen energy and water appropriation bill that we have under consideration today actually spends about eighty seven million uh... more than we did last year. Uh, with a $1.3 trillion deficit and a national debt that's mo now more than $15 trillion, uh, I think we've, we've got to do better here. Uh, so this amendment uh, uh, simply says, let's pare it back. Let's do an across-the-board cut of 0.027. Now, the reason we picked that number is that would bring us back exactly to last year. I think when you look across the country, you look what state and local governments are doing in order to balance their budgets, sometimes they're going all the way back to 2005, 2004, or maybe more to balance their budgets. And what are we doing here in Congress uh, with a $15 trillion deficit, or I'm sorry, debt? Uh, we're actually increasing spending on some bills. Now, we've cut others, and I, I've supported uh, the so-called Ryan budget uh, where we do make some overall cuts, and that's good. But when you have a bill like this, I don't know how we can justify increasing spending $87 million over last year. Uh, so again, some will say, well, this conforms to the 
the, the budget agreement, uh, the, the Ryan Budget Act and the 302A levels that we've set. Uh, that is true, it does, but I would suggest that if we're increasing funding here, this is a good place to find savings and perhaps the 302B level should have been set a little lower. So I would urge adoption of the amendment. Uh, again, this is simply a cut that would take us back to where we were last year. Not 2008 or 9, but FY12. I don't think that's unreasonable. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from uh, New Jersey is recognized. Madam what Chair, I, moved, uh, I rise to uh, claim time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized in opposition. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong uh, opposition, opposition to the gentleman's amendment. I take exception to any claim that our bill unnecessarily increases spending. There is one reason that this bill is $188 million above fiscal year 2000. It's defense, national security. Many members may not realize it that nearly one-third of our bill supports critical national security needs, including nuclear weapons. That is actually the origin of why we have a Department of Energy today, is the Atomic Energy Act. Only two subcommittees received increases in fiscal year 2013, the Energy and Water Bill and the Defense Bill, because those increases are needed to support national security. There no, there's no other reasons. The defense portion of this bill is almost $300 million more than last year, an increase which directly supports our nuclear weapons and national security. Even with those security increases, our bill is still less than one-third of 1% 1 above last year's bill. That means the rest of the bill is cut deeply. It means that spending for our non-defense accounts is cut by $800 million below last year's levels. Even with the increase for defense spending, our bill is still below 2009 levels, actually quite close to 2008 levels. So I'll not accept any criticism that our bill in any way is not reflective of this body's work to reduce spending. The House's commitment to cut spending, federal spending, was fully engaged in, by, in a bipartisan way by the Energy and Water Subcommittee. The gentleman's amendment would cut the bill simply because of the increases we provided for defense spending. To be clear, the amendment is, to, is a cut to national security. And that's, the po that's the point I'll make very clear to any member who has questions on whether to vote for this amendment. I urge my colleagues to vote no to protect defense spending. But may I also add a postscript? Uh, our bill historically has done things for a lot of states, and Arizona has benefited from the Central Arizona Water Project. It may have not happened during uh, Mr. Flake's tenure as a member of Congress, but in a bipartisan way, we've looked after the needs of, of, of Arizona, uh, his, his constituents and Arizonians. Uh, we are reducing spending, and even as we reduce spending, we have obligations to look after other needs across the country in the energy sector as well as the water sector, of which, sector to which I relate the Arizona, Central Arizona project. So we're cutting spending, we're reducing spending, we're keeping our commitment to the Ameri American taxpayers, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from, okay. uh, from Indiana is Move recognized. Move to the last word. Without objection. Appreciate the recognition and also uh, want to add my voice to the chairs in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, we just had a colloquy on the House floor with uh, several members from the state of Pennsylvania uh, relative to the fate of 230 lock chambers on our inland waterways uh, that carry hundreds of <coughs> millions of tons of cargo. Uh, if they fail, we would need, as has already been mentioned this morning, 24 million additional trucks that would cost billions more in fuel and generate millions of tons of pollution. These locks that are the backbone of this nation's inland waterway system were built with a 50-year design life. Many of those that exist in western Pennsylvania are now over a hundred years old. Relative to cuts, uh, I want to emphasize uh, to our colleagues 
uh, that there was a lot of work that the chairman, the members of this subcommittee, the staffs put into this bill to make very discreet, discerning decisions, and in many instances to make cuts. I would take simply one program as an example. Uh, that's environmental cleanup. We have, again, a national responsibility to clean up these legacies of the Cold War for the health and safety of 300 million people. But we made discreet decisions for defense environmental site-by-site -site decisions, for example, on the Office of River Protection in the state of Washington, we are $30 million below last year's level. For the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the state of Tennessee, we're $20 million below last year's level. For the Savannah River site in South Carolina, we are $43 million current uh, year level. For the waste isolation, uh, isolation uh, pilot plant, uh, we are $12 million of below last year's level. And for technology development, to do a better job on this, we're $1 million below. We made discrete decisions. Uh, I would simply close by saying that the gentleman, uh, at the close of his remarks, said that he wants this cut to take us back to where we were. Those locks were built a hundred years ago. I don't want to go back there. We are here to take this nation forward, to invest in the future of this nation so that the young people of this nation have a future. I do not want to go back to where we were. I am adamantly opposed to the gentleman's amendment and would yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. I, I thank the the chair, I, I would simply meant what I said was take back the spending level uh, to where we were last year. Uh, nobody wants to go back in time, but if we want to talk uh, a future for our kids, as was mentioned, uh, saddling them with $15 trillion in debt doesn't give them much of a future. And, and that's the problem here. We just keep doing that, bill after bill after bill after bill, increasing spending. I, uh, I take the gentleman's point on, on the needs of defense. Uh, but uh, we've got to find savings. Uh, we've got to find savings here. We can't continue to go on and pile up more debt. And I would suggest that uh, finding uh, savings amounting to one quarter of one penny on this bill is not unreasonable. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman uh, yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. On that, uh, Madam Chair, I would ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. DeFazio of Oregon. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. That's the gentleman from uh, New Jersey is recognized. The gentleman's amendment. Point of order is reserved. The clerk will continue reading. Uh, as in as consent, the reading be suspended. Is the objection to dispense with the uh, uh, further reading of the amendment? Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Uh, I, thank, uh, I thank the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, very, very uh, dramatic map. Uh, the colors indicate uh, uh, gasoline prices across America as of uh, last week by county. And as you can see, the entire west coast of the United States is in bright red. Now, we often hear from the uh, oil uh, and gas industry, prices are set internationally. This is an international market. You have to understand that. Well, that's kind of interesting. Crude oil prices are down dramatically. U.S. production of crude is up a million and a half barrels a day. We're exporting gasoline from the United States of America. But somehow, we're missing that international market on the West Coast. We're being price gouged on the West Coast of the United States through a series of rather interesting or perhaps suspicious circumstances. Uh, the largest refinery 
In Washington State, uh, Cherry Point experienced a fire in February, and it's been uh, quite a bit of time uh, in recovering. It's been delayed several times. It's now coming back online. But uh, given the fact that it was known that the largest refinery in, in the Northwest uh, was offline, one would think that other refineries in California would endeavor to stay online, particularly as we begin the summer driving season. Well, no, actually not, uh, because uh, they had to do routine maintenance. So five uh, refineries in California, uh, just before Memorial Day weekend in May, decided that it was time for routine maintenance. Then suddenly we had a shortage. Well, actually, we didn't have a shortage. There were no gas stations with little yellow flags. There were no gas stations with little red flags. There was, you know, no one was going without gasoline, but a shortage was declared by the industry, and the price was jacked up. So while the rest of the country has seen prices come down following the international markets, the price on the West Coast has gone up, skyrocketing. Last week, 13 cents for a gallon of regular in one week. It went up. Dropped a penny yesterday. Woo! All right, we're on the way down. Seems it always goes down a lot slower than it goes up. Kind of interesting. So I've uh, contacted uh, the president's working group uh, for uh, uh, oil price and market manipulation. And uh, my uh, inquiry has been referred to various uh, departments uh, within the government, including the Justice Department, to look at antitrust uh, implications, the Commodity Future Trading Commissions, and others to look at potential market manipulation. So I just thought that uh, in light of the fact that there may have been may have been some market manipulation here and perhaps at other times in the past, that we should just have a simple statement of fact on behalf of the United States House of Representatives. No oil or gas company convicted of antitrust violations should be able to access any of the $500 million in the fossil energy research and development section. That is to say, taxpayers of the United States should not gift money to oil and gas companies that have been convicted of price gouging the taxpayers of the United States of America. Pretty simple. Uh, I mean, I have even greater concerns over that account, and I joined with 102 Republicans last night and 36 Democrats in voting to delete uh, the $500 million for fossil energy research and development. I think the industry can fund it on its own. Uh, and I would hope at least those 102 Republicans last night who voted to totally eliminate that account and the 36 Democrats who voted to totally eliminate that account would join with me today to say, well, we didn't eliminate the account, but we're not going to allow anybody convicted of antitrust, that is price gouging American consumers and taxpayers, to access these taxpayer dollars to subsidize their private research and profits. Uh, with that, I would uh, yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of Move his time. Move to strike the last word. The, the gentleman is recognized. Appreciate the recognition. Uh, I would simply uh, note that what the gentleman from Oregon proposes uh, is a common sense approach uh, to ensuring the highest ethical standards for companies that receive a contract with the DOE's Office of Fossil Energy. We should not be rewarding companies that have a history of predatory economic practices with federal contractors. Uh, if his amendment is allowed in order, I would certainly urge my colleagues to support it, and I would yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise to claim time in opposition. The uh, gentleman highlights, of course, some very difficult issues that deserve our attention, and especially I share my colleagues' concern about gasoline prices, and that's why the committee has focused on trying to reduce uh, gas prices in the future. However, the areas of antitrust determinations, compliance, and enforcement that he mentions, uh, quite honestly, are within the purview of the authorizing committee. We're aware of them. We're acutely aware of them. We, we understand where he's coming from. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation on an appropriations bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part, an amendment to a general appropriation bill should not be in order if changing existing law. The amendment imposes additional duties. I ask for a ruling from the Chair.
any member wish to be heard on this point of order? If not, the chair will rule. The gentleman from New Jersey makes a point of order that the amendment offered by the gentleman from Oregon proposes to change existing law in violation of Clause 26 of Rule 21. The amendment would limit funds for an assistant secretary in the Department of Energy to implement or administer any change to a cited regulation as in effect on January 19, 2001. The chair is aware that such standard is no longer effective under current law. The amendment would therefore require a determination by the Assistant Secretary of the State of prior regulation and a further determ determination of what, if anything, has affected a change to that prior regulation. By requiring a new determination, the amendment constitutes legislation within the meaning of Clause 2C of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained. The amendment is not in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? I have an amendment in the desk designated as Flake number two. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake of Arizona. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. I ask section. unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Pursuant to the order of that, is there an, is there an objection to the dispensing of the reading of the, of the amendment? If not, pursuant to the order of the House of Tuesday, June 5th, the gentleman, does the gentleman from Washington reserve the right to object? Yeah, I, I, didn't, under, I didn't hear what the, uh, what the request was. How, just to dispense, to with, dispense the reading. with the reading of the amendment. Oh, that's fine. Without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to the order of the House of Tuesday, June 5, 2012, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Flake, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. I thank the chair. I know we've been on this bill a long time, and I don't plan to take uh, my full five minutes here. Uh, this amendment would simply prohibit funding for the Department of Energy battery and electronic, uh, or I'm sorry, electric drive technology program, uh, preventing unnecessary federal spending to the tune of about 171 million. Uh, we all know that for too long, uh, Washington has meddled too much in the energy market. Not only has the government provided uh, or proved itself to be ill-equipped. Uh, to pick winners and losers, uh, I think government is just plain bad at it. And a list of winners is dubious at best, and it's a diverse one, from oil subsidies, ethanol mandates, Solyndra, and now the Chevy Volt. The common thread is a seeming endless supply, an endless stream of taxpayer funding. Enter the Batteries and Electric Drive Technology Program. This is one of the countless acronyms that taxpayers know little of, uh, despite helping to fund these programs to the tune of a few hundred million dollars. Interesting, uh, interestingly, the BEDT is the very program that developed the Chevy Bolt battery that we've all heard so much about, uh, and the, uh, I think the manufacturing lines uh, that are now stopping or diminishing. Uh, while I wholeheartedly support my colleagues' commitment to work to reduce the burden of rising uh, energy and gasoline prices, I believe that it would be imprudent to acquiesce key funding in this regard to, uh, to uh, components of the President's Go Green or Go Bust initiative. Uh, this hasn't gone too well, and I don't know why we continue to fund it. Instead, I think we ought to eliminate energy subsidies and preferential policies while encouraging free market growth and innovation. We can start out by eliminating funding for the BEDT. I urge support for the amendment and uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Uh, Madam Chair, I rise to claim time in opposition. I the gentleman is recognized. Rise to oppose minutes. the amendment. Uh, uh, there is a absolutely valuable, cutting-edge research in the Department of Energy that enables future generations of vehicle technologies to proceed. Technologies that are too far in the future for American private sectors to support but that will keep future generations of manufacturing and jobs here in the United States and have the consequence of lowering what Americans have to pay for gasoline at the pump. This amendment, and, and we're all supporting cutting wasteful spending, would virtually eliminate this important piece of our comprehensive approach, and therefore I strongly oppose it. Yield back the balance of my time.
The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Indiana. Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I also uh, rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, we need to move away from our dependency on fuel imported by unfriendly nations. Uh, I have, uh, in past debates on this floor, and I would do it again, uh, referenced the senior senator from Indiana, Senator Luger, who has long characterized our energy crisis uh, paramount uh, as one of national security, given where those petroleum purchases uh, take place. Uh, the fact is, if we can get more miles per gallon, uh, we have solved part of that national security crisis. Uh, none of us today standing here or sitting here are going to be able to do much about the price of a barrel of oil. But if each one of those individual uh, drivers uh, can get some relief by getting an extra mile per gallon for their vehicle, we have also helped ameliorate uh, their economic pressure and the cost that they have. Uh, I think it is short-sighted uh, to eliminate this program, which has the potential to address a major issue in the viability and practicality of electric vehicles, and that is the battery. We need to be looking at the cost, performance, life, and abuse tolerance of batteries, and I do support the Department's efforts on this front and have been active uh, for a number of years in seeking additional funds for it because I think it is of great value to this country's future. I oppose the gentleman's amendment and would yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. I thank the chair. Um, it was mentioned that uh, government research, federal government, typically gets involved in research when it's something that uh, when the return is too far out uh, for commercial enterprise to realize any benefit. I would suggest that that just doesn't apply here at all. We're talking about batteries and, and those who tout this program <laughs> claim that we already have evidence on the road, uh, the Chevy Volt, of this technology working. So that's not too far out. So if there's technology on the road, or in this case, uh, mostly still sitting in the lots, apparently, because these cars aren't selling very well, but it, it's not out there too far in the future. And so I, I think we get uh, confused about what really is the role of the federal government with regard to research uh, when we have programs like this where there could be profit and is in certain technologies tomorrow and it becomes less research and more subsidy and that's where I think this program falls into with that I urge support for the amendment and yield back the balance of my time thank you the gentleman uh, yields back the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona those in favor say aye those opposed no in the opinion of the chair the no's have it the amendment is not agreed to For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Madam Speaker, I have an amendment to the desk designated as Flake number three. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Flake of Arizona. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. What None of the funds made available under this act may be used by the Department of Energy. Consent to dispense with the reading. Is there, Is there objection to the dispensing of the reading? Without objection. Pursuant to the order of the House of Tuesday, June 5, 2010,